What up, Cavs Nation? I'm your host, Ethan Sands, and I'm back with another episode of the Want and Gold Talk Podcast. It's the offseason, but I still got the best dude in the business joining me on the podcast, Chris Fedor. What's going on, Chris? How's the offseason life treating you, buddy? <laughs> it has been glorious the last couple of days, although it does feel like there's something that I should be doing work-wise. Um, that's just like the feeling that I always get in the off season. Cause it's the regular season, such a grind and it's over and over and over again. And it's constantly writing and constantly talking to people and thinking about new ideas and all that kind of stuff. Um, so not having that, not having that level of responsibility that I have during the season feels kind of weird for me. So I think I'm still just trying to get used to what is my new normal for the next couple of months. But, it was great being able to take Elliot to the park today. Uh, we were able to go take a look at a new car for my wife, all that kind of stuff that, that I would not normally have time for. Big whip purchases in the near future Buddy. for the Fedor per- family? Buddy. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's, it's a family SUV, but <laughs> nonetheless, it's still a hey, newer one. <laughs> new is new. New is new. <laughs> but, hey, now, nah, so... We have been talking about J.B. Bickerstaff. As much as there is, quote-unquote, no new news that we can <laughs> report on, there's speculation, and there is a upcoming discussion or press conference with Kobe Altman later this week where we'll hear a little bit more of the organization's point of view of everything going on. And, Chris, I don't know about you, but I'm expecting them to make a decision on J.B. Bickerstaff before Kobe Altman talks to the press. What is your indication on that? Well, it would be logical for him to do it before um, before he talks to us, but but I don't think there's a guarantee of that because I think like part of this equation, Ethan, when it comes to um, any kind of decision regarding JB, is can they do better or what else is out there for them to try and go get. Um, You know, Phoenix obviously had a plan in mind that if they were going to move on from Frank Vogel, which they did, there was a guy out there that they felt reasonably sure that they could go out and get. And they did. And it was Mike Budenholzer. And at the time, Coach Bud was the best coaching candidate on the market. So they felt like, hey, if we're going to move on from Frank Vogel, yeah, that's probably a risk. Yeah, he's a good coach. He might get other opportunities elsewhere. But there's somebody else for us to move toward immediately. And they scooped up Bud. When it comes to the Cavs, you know, they have to look at all the different candidates that could potentially be available to them, um, whether those guys would actually be interested in coming to Cleveland, send out the feelers that they would need to send out, Um, They're also, the front office of the Cavs is also doing some draft stuff. Uh, They all gathered in Chicago for the NBA Combine. Now they're headed to Los Angeles for the player agent workouts that are going on in L.A. And then Kobe's going to be back at the end of this week. And it's not to say that just because they're in a different location other than Cleveland that they can't possibly make a decision on JB or they can't use their mind to to go elsewhere. Um, But... There's a lot that they're trying to sort through at this point in time beyond the JB conversation. Um, And and I do think it's an extensive one, and I don't think it's one that they're going to rush. So one, if they feel good about whatever decision it is that they're going to make with JB and they feel comfortable about it, then they'll go ahead and they'll move forward. Uh, Two, if they feel comfortable and confident Um, with the potential candidates that they could replace JB with, then I think they would have no problem pulling the trigger. But the sense that I get, Ethan, is that they just aren't going to rush into this because there's an argument, certainly, for keeping him based on what he's accomplished as a head coach here in Cleveland. And I think just like that, there's an argument for uh, moving on from him. So I think a lot of factors are in play. And then when there are um, a lot of factors in play, um, it's not usually something that comes hastily. Chris, we talked all season about the reactions that we have been seeing and getting from this fan base about 
Fire Jamie Bickerstaff. Get rid of Jamie Bickerstaff. It's Jamie Bickerstaff's fault. And turned at the end of the season, it's Kobe Altman's fault. So right. I said, let's go to the subtexters. Let's okay. get their opinion uh, based on especially all the information that we have been giving them all season long, along with the podcast information that we've been hitting them on five days of the week. And I threw a poll, I, and I threw a poll at them. And I said, what do you think? Should the Cavs stick with J.B. Bickerstaff for next season? Yes or no? And this poll, Chris, based on all the different reactions that we got throughout the season, was a mm-hmm. lot closer than I thought it was going to be. So the exact question that I asked, and I'm going to say this now, I've gotten some, like I said, I'm the guy that reads the Twitter comments. I'm the guy that reads the YouTube comments and all that stuff, trying to make sure we continue to upgrade this podcast and give you guys the content that we want. And I've gotten some feedback saying that I look down at my phone too much when I'm <laughs> trying to pull up stats and stuff because I don't want to pull up stuff on my computer and change the brightness and stuff. But I'm going to pull it up on the computer and see what y'all think. So here's the exact question that I asked. It was, should J.B. Bickerstaff remain the head coach of the Cavs? And Chris, 54.84% said no. said yes. That's Mm. really close in the eyes of a poll being done on a marginalized, like it's a different kind of group that we have with South Texas. It's a community that, like I've said, we give them different information. So maybe they have a different perspective, more insight, more knowledge when it comes to what (laughs) regular fans do. And maybe that is a plug for you guys to go subscribe to Subtext. But I think that's generally pretty close for a poll that we had that's usually waning in one way or the other. What do you think about how these Subtexters are responding to this poll, Chris? Ethan, I'm not all that surprised by it. If we're being perfectly honest, I understand that in the moment there's been a lot of frustration with JB, but I think if you take a step back and you try and take a clear-eyed view of it um, and you allow the emotions to kind of die down from from everything that happened throughout the course of the season, because it was a very emotional season, even Max Struess and a couple of the players were talking about, you know, this was a lot. We went through a lot this year. This was tough. This was challenging. But when you take a step back from that, and you take emotion out of it because you don't want to make an emotional decision. Um, It's not like he has been a disaster as a coach. It's not like this era under um, JB has been a failure for this team in any sort of way. He brought them out of the rebuild darkness. Um, It was a terrible situation that he took over. The John Beeline situation was a complete and utter disaster. Everything about it was disastrous. It did not work whatsoever. And there was no guarantee that the Cavs were going to find a new coach in JB like they did. And they were going to get to this point where they made back-to-back playoff appearances, where they won their first playoff series um, without LeBron James in 30 years. We can't just sit here and pretend like that was a guarantee because at the time that he took over, that was far from a guarantee. There was very little hope. There was very little optimism for the future of this team. Obviously, Donovan Mitchell coming in two years ago in the blockbuster trade, it uh, changed expectations. Um, it, It changed the timeline for the organization. It pushed this rebuild much, much further. But JB was the one who oversaw everything. So I can understand why it's almost 50-50, because I do think there's a legitimate case to keep him, and I think there's a legitimate argument against keeping him. And that's why I think it's going to be a tough decision for this organization. And it's not a situation, Ethan, where to me it's, did this did this stretch with JB lead to success? Because like if you're asking that question, The answer is yes, right? Back-to-back seasons um, with nearly 50 wins, back-to-back playoff appearances, um, a top 10 defense three years in a row, and and that's his bread and butter. That's his forte. Um, A a culture that's been put into place 
that is about competitiveness, playing hard, sacrifice, togetherness, toughness, all those different things. Um, so I don't think that's the question that the front office is asking, honestly, because if this is about taking steps as an organization and evolving as an organization for the Cavs, the next step is, can we get to the level of Boston? Right? Can we get to the level of the Milwaukee Bucks when fully healthy or the New York Knicks or the Philadelphia 76ers? However you feel about the hierarchy in the Eastern Conference, it's no longer just about winning a playoff series, right? It's no longer just about getting to that particular level. It's about, can we take the next step? Can we compete for a championship? Can we get on the same level as the other top teams in the Eastern Conference? And that is a different kind of question than was this four-year stretch under JB, four-plus-year stretch under JB, a success? It's do we have the right coach to get us to the place that ultimately we want to get to? Uh, so, of course, Chris, I threw this poll in the subtext channel that we have, and I did not ask them only to give their response, but I said, if you are so inclined to say that J.B. Bickerstaff should get the boot, who should his replacement mm. be? Because mm -hmm. that has been what the question has been more so. And I'm going to read through some of these responses. And because I got it in front of me on the computer, they're a little bit bigger than they are on my phone. So we might get more <laughs> in depth. All right. Yeah. So here's the first one. <laughs> And Chris, I know you are here for the chaos, and I love it, but here, here's the first one. Not a response to JB at all. Kobe should be the one looking for a job. Ridiculous, he didn't make moves at all at the All-Star break. So, we're just going to move past that, because that's a well, conversation. I'll say, this, though. I'll say this, though, Ethan. I, I do think that there needs to be an evaluation of Kobe Altman. Um, I, I do think that Dan Gilbert needs to ask himself, is, is Kobe good enough at building a team, a cohesive team? Because I don't think there's a question about can he assemble talent because he has done, can he identify talent because he has done that. But to me, the question surrounding the Cavs is, do the pieces fit well enough for it to come together the way that ultimately you want it to? Um, because if we're talking about going into another era of Cavs basketball with Donovan Mitchell, and that's obviously the hope for the Cavs, it's not about just making the playoffs. It's not just about getting out of the first round of the playoffs. It's about, like I said, conference finals and finals appearances. And that's where team building matters, right? That's where fit really, really matters. If you're just a team that is looking um, to get to the playoffs or win a first round series, like fit isn't so much the driving force of that. Um, it's about assembling as much talent as you possibly can. And, and I do think there are legitimate questions about um, does Kobe have a high enough level of understanding of team building and fit, or is he somebody who um, has not shown the ability to do that and he's more somebody who can just like assemble talent, just like we're sitting here and we're asking the question about JB, is he the right guy to take the next step with this team? Or do they need somebody who can infuse like different philosophies and different principles? Um, do, do the Cavs need somebody who can create more of a dynamic modern offense? Um, it's the same thing when it comes to Kobe, like, okay, it's great that he has assembled talent, and it's great that you can make an argument that the Cavs have four of the top 50-ish players in the NBA, but do those players fit well enough together? And is he willing to make the difficult roster-related decisions when it comes to fit? So I understand why a subtexter responded with that kind of thing, because I do think um, that he should be under evaluation as well. And I'm in complete agreement. I just wish it was going to come under the <laughs> subtext and the poll that will be coming out right. probably later this week or next That's week right. about Kobe Altman. So yeah. we're going to get to Kobe. Don't get yeah. me wrong. I'm not there leaving him off. 
there, there was a different time and a different place for all of these things. I promise. I promise. We're going to get through yeah. Okay. Next subtexter says, Dave Edelman. Thankfully, Denver got knocked out last night, so Adelman. we can get the wheels turning on that. <laughs> okay. And Dave Adelman. Chris Adelman. Here we go again with my mispronunciations. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm reading these for the first time, and I had a friend <laughs> in high school that his last name was spelled the same name, and it was Adelman. Okay, I apologize. Yeah. Adelman. Okay. So, Chris, I did the Solo Dolo podcast yesterday, and I just talked about the Game 7s, and this subtext brings me back to that because, my goodness, were those some games. And Mm -hmm. We're going to get into the JB, but I wanted to get into your thoughts. And we had said that it was going to be Denver Nuggets, Boston Celtics in the NBA Finals. Now that's not a possibility. What do you think of the shape up and how everything has panned out, especially with that game seven between the Timberwolves and the Nuggets with the Nuggets, with the Nuggets giving up a 20 point deficit for a 20 point lead, which is the biggest loss in NBA uh, NBA playoff history of Game Seven in the play by play era. So, just what are your thoughts on that before we get back into the nicks and crannies of this JB stuff? Well, it's basically something that I've been talking about for the last couple of months, Ethan. There are no guarantees when you get into playoff basketball. Um, a little bit of it is luck. A little bit of it is talent. A little bit of it is. X's and O's and coaching, a little bit of it is shooting variance, a little bit of it is the right matchup that you're going up against. So there's just so many things that go into winning a playoff series in the NBA that you can't take those things for granted and you can't just assume them. So even though for the Cavs, it went seven games against Orlando and maybe it was a harder series than what people expected, what people wanted, um, you can't start taking that for granted and saying, well, it should have been a different outcome. The outcome is, do you win it or do you lose it? And for Denver, you know, this was a team that I thought it was going to be really, really difficult to beat them four times in seven tries. And and for Minnesota to go on the road um, and find a way to do that, despite facing some steep odds, despite having to play from behind, in that kind of environment against that caliber team, I think it speaks volumes for a team like Minnesota. I also think it speaks volumes for um, an understanding of of how to win in, in playoff basketball environments that Minnesota had other places sprinkled throughout their roster, right? Yes, you had the young players, the inexperienced players, the up-and-coming players like Jaden McDaniels and Anthony Edwards. But those guys were kind of buoyed by Mike Conley, a guy who has been there, done that, right? A veteran, a stabilizing force on that team. Uh, Rudy Gobert, somebody who has been in the playoffs, played in big games throughout the course of his career. And I, I think that's something that stood out to me about Minnesota is just their level of connectivity, their level of poise, their level of not being rattled in this beyond the fact that their roster is really difficult from a matchup perspective beyond the fact that they play their butts off on the defensive end of the floor and they really get after it and they make any team look bad at various points because of the way that they can defend um, and because of the uniqueness of their roster. Um, the fact that they were able to handle that environment, keep their composure um, play with that level of poise despite being looked at as like a young team because there are some young pieces there uh, that was really really impressive to me and I wouldn't I wouldn't count them out in any series moving forward um, against Dallas here if they get to the NBA finals because to me they showed a lot by beating um, the champions it's very very difficult to do that especially on the road so kudos to them yeah, I mean, Nikola Jokic and a couple of other guys on the Denver Nuggets literally said that it is now a rivalry. Like they, they Nikola Jokic literally said that the Minnesota Timberwolves are built to beat them. 
the Denver right. Nuggets. Like that is a <laughs> crazy statement to make after a game seven and also knowing how both teams are constructed. And you look at like both the teams and the players that they have, you mentioned it, the veterans like Mike Conley. And then you look across and you see the guys who have been to the NBA finals. And it's like, wow, this, these are two very different things. And my biggest thing that I said yesterday and yesterday's podcast was how can you not be romantic about sports? Because <laughs> that was incredible. One, the hoops to be able to be come back and all that stuff. But to do it 20 years to the day from the last time they won a game seven and on Kevin Garnett's birthday to potentially make it to the NBA finals and play his other team, man, it, 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 you just can't make this stuff up. But Ethan, does it give you any kind of feel um, or any kind of new belief about the viability of Evan Mobley and Jared Allen together because they're doing it with Rudy Gobert and Carl Anthony Towns? So this is the conversation I also had yesterday, Chris, because this is now an NBA where two bigs are becoming the state. And it kind of started with Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, the belief that teams could do this together. And when you really think about it, this is what I my what my take was from yesterday. I think that the only reason that Jared Allen should get traded for the from the Cavaliers next season is if the Cavs can pair Jared with Darius Garland for a monster all star or player that is like on a win now basis. And mm-hmm. that would move Donovan Mitchell to the one, Max Struess to his normal position of playing shooting guard because we know that he's kind of undersized to play the three but he showed a lot to do that this season then you go get a three i said three and d but all-star caliber Mm -hmm. all-star caliber player is what i was looking for all nba player would be even better because of how high the specs are on jared allen and darius garland right now and then Mm -hmm. Obviously, you would need that three to be big, or you also go get a four and have Evan Mobley slide to the five. But, you know, in all honesty, I've been saying this offline to people that I've talked about the situation with that Jared Allen and Evan Mobley have, like you said, Chris, like they've had the best defense or one of the best defenses over the last five years in the NBA. And that's because of the both of them and the players right. that they've been, they've been able to put around them. But yep. knowing that Jarrett is such a key piece, and also if J.B. Brickerstaff stays, like you know because of the pre- post-game press conference after Game 5 against uh, <laughs> that the Boston Celtics, like when I asked him, do you move Evan to the 5 full-time? And he was like, mm-hmm. we have Jarrett Allen. And that is like... You understand the love that's there. You understand what he has built. J.B. Biggerstaff built this defense around those two. That's his staple. You said it, Chris, on multiple occasions. That's their identity. So mm-hmm. to try and take that away while keeping the same coach doesn't really feel the same for me. So I keeping Jared and Evan and going and getting a, a three that can space the floor, play defense as an all, all-star caliber for Darius Garland, That sounds ideal to me if that's the situation that they want to go with. Well, let's just say this. The the Cavs are not trading Darius Garland and Jared Allen in the same deal for Brandon Ingram. If that's what New Orleans would offer the Cavs, Kobe Altman would hang up the phone immediately. That's not enough. No, 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 no. So maybe if New Orleans threw in something else, brought in a third team, a fourth team, something along those lines. Um, but but the idea of using either Jarrett or Darius or both of them together to improve the clear weak point on this roster to me is very very logical. And if the Cavs um, you know get the kind of offer that they would want to get in order to go down that road, then I think it's something they would explore, and I think it's something they should explore, um, even pull the trigger if it's the right deal. But I just don't think they have the kind of season, Ethan, and I don't think they have um, the, the, the kind of setup toward the future where all of a sudden they need to panic 
and they need to overreact to a loss against the Celtics or to um, a situation where they're desperate to do something because they're afraid of losing Donovan Mitchell or something along those lines. You know what I mean? Um, if they get the right pieces that will allow this team to take another step forward um, and continue down the path that ultimately they want to be on, okay, then you consider that and you understand that if you're going to get something of value in return, you're going to have to send out something of value. And, and Darius Garland trading him should be painful for this organization because they drafted him, they developed him, they paid him, he made the all-star team with them. And there's a belief that, you know, he can still get better. And there were circumstances tied to his terrible season this year. And then when it comes to Jarrett, look, Everything for this organization changed when Jared Allen came here. He helped give them an identity at both ends of the floor. There are people inside the organization that before Evan Mobley got here, before Darius became an all-star, before Donovan Mitchell arrived, that the most important move that this organization made was getting Jared Allen from the Brooklyn Nets because of all the different things that he brought to this organization. Um, and, and he plays a winning style and offensively, he's really, really good in the pick and roll, which is what the Cavs want to do on the offensive end because Donovan's so good in the pick and roll because Darius is so good in the pick and roll, but you need a pick and roll dance partner. And Jared Allen is one of the league leaders every single year in screen assists. Jared Allen is one of the league leaders in efficiency when it comes to pick and roll as the big man. Um, so you can't just like throw him to the side and say, we're done with him. It didn't work. Just give us whatever in return. It's got to make sense for the Cavs to go that direction. And I think one of the differences, if, if you think of the makeup between Gobert and Cat, it's pretty obvious, right? Cat is one of the best big men shooters in the entire NBA. So Rudy has always needed that kind of guy playing next to him. And the question is, what kind of player does Jarrett need next to him? What kind of player does Evan need next to him if he's going to transition to the full-time five? And I think both of those guys, obviously the Cavs would choose Evan over Jarrett. That's a no-brainer because of his upside. Um, so if we're talking about Evan transitioning to the five full-time, it's what kind of player does he need next to him? And I think we have seen enough evidence of it that he needs spacing and shooting around him just the way that, you know, Rudy Gobert as the anchor of the, the Timberwolves defense needs a spacer shooter to complement his game. And I just don't know, even though the Cavs defensively have been so good with both those two guys on the floor um, at the same time, I just don't know that they complement each other well enough on the offensive end for this team to become the offensive team that one, it wants to be, and two, it needs to be for playoff level basketball. In saying that, both of them together in the first four games against Orlando, they were good. They were good together. Um, the Cavs weren't good together in that series for a majority of it, and their overall numbers in terms of net rating not very good because they lost a couple of games by like 30 points. So that's going to skew those numbers. But with Jarrett and, and Evan together on the floor, uh, their numbers were good enough. That was only one series, though. That was only one matchup. That was only one style of opponent. And I, I don't think you can make a whole bunch of decisions based on that. I think there's enough data that points to the limitations of those two guys offensively. Small sample sizes, Chris. Those are the bane of our existence. Yes, man. very dangerous. <laughs> but, I mean, you mentioned it. Like, the Cavs should not be overreacting to a Eastern Conference semifinal series mm -hmm. loss to the Boston Celtics. The same way I don't think the New York Knicks are having a panic attack over their loss to the <laughs> Indiana Pacers with four starters injured. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you got to think of all of these things going on. But I do want to get back to the poll and the subtexters and get into these uh, these suggestions of coaches. So, Because I definitely want to see what you think, who could be the best fit that they give you. Because mm -hmm. like we've talked about, I don't know if there is a better fit for this team than J.B. Bickerstaff. Because like we've talked about, it's hard to 
just bring in somebody brand new and say, here's the chemistry of the organization. Here's something that you have not been a part of for the last five years that have been completely changed since he got here. We want you to continue to uplift this team because maybe he he or she might be better at one thing than JB Biggerstaff, mm-hmm. but the relation aspect that JB might have or might still have in that locker room is completely different because of what he's been able to experience with them. And that's all saying if JB Biggerstaff still has the love from the locker room, which I don't know if he does or not. We're going to get into these next couple subtext suggestions. Okay. And the next one comes from in-house. I say give Luke Walton a shot. He's been a longtime assistant with winning teams. He's had head coaching experience and gone through some struggles. He's a good mix of experience with the team, head coaching experience, and a history with innovative organizations and great players. I think that's an interesting one because I don't think I've seen that a whole lot. But I'm going to run through a couple more of these. Mm -hmm. The next one just says Kenny Atkinson. The next one then reads, if we go the retread route. um, Retread. Retread route. I feel like Frank Vogel has been screwed over a couple times. I could handle handle Vogel. Um, Hello, Ethan. I feel a coach like Sam Cassell would be Mm -hmm. a good candidate. He was a champion, and I like his ties to Hakeem Olajuwon to assist our young big. Whoever the new coach is, they should be one who has vision of how offense should be run with emphasis on development. Cassell also PD dues. I think that's supposed to be paid his dues Mm -hmm. and was a defensive stalwart personally. That's from Andrew in Cleveland Heights. Yeah. So, okay. Those are just a, a couple. We'll get into a few more, but I wanted to get your thoughts on those couple, Chris. So just figuring out what this, where these subtexters are going and what you might think might be more advantageous as a coaching hire for this Cavs team. The other thing is, Ethan, we cannot assume that mystery box B over here on the right side is going to yield better results. Maybe, but there's an inherent risk in going down the road of the guy who has not been a head coach before, and he has been an assistant, he has paid his dues, and he's ready to take that leap. You know what I mean? Um, there is a chance that maybe one of these guys, Mike Inori, David Adelman, Sean Sweeney, Chris Quinn from Miami, Alex Jensen, who was with the Cleveland Charge at one point, and he was also with Donovan Mitchell in Utah. Like, There's a chance that that person becomes the league's next assistant to head coach success story, Um, becomes the coach for the Oklahoma City Thunder. You know what I mean? But there is inherent risk for a team that is, one, looking to satisfy Donovan Mitchell, looking to show that they're um, serious about competing for a championship, Um, looking to show that they're ready to take the next step and and get into that same tier with Boston, Milwaukee, Philly, New York, and some of these other Eastern Conference teams. Um, Ask the Milwaukee Bucks about it, right? They had on one hand, championship coach Mike Budenholzer thinking to themselves, we need a new voice, right? We need somebody with a new philosophy. We need somebody with better development. We need somebody with better concepts, whatever it was that they said about coach Bud. And they said to themselves, we can do better. We can find somebody outside this organization that can bring in different things, um, better things. And he can bring something that coach Bud lacks. Well, how did that work out? How'd that work out for Milwaukee? They ended up firing Adrian Griffin halfway through the season because he wasn't the right person. And then they had to overpay for Doc Rivers. And and they had a disappointing season and they flamed out in the first round of the playoffs. So you have to be careful in just assuming that, hey, this next assistant coach in waiting, this up and coming guy is going to be better than JB or, oh, he can't be any worse than JB because of his offensive limitations because of his in-game adjusting that's not good enough because of his 
um, X's and O's because of his minute allocation for guys. It could be worse. There's no doubt that it could get worse. And Milwaukee shows that. Um, in saying that, like, yeah, I mean, I think there's certainly an argument for bringing in somebody outside this organization, um, somebody that is clearly respected, um, somebody that is clearly um, in consideration for other jobs across the NBA. There's a reason why these guys are on short lists when it comes to um, whatever opening is is going to be out there in the NBA. And who knows, maybe some more come this offseason. Um the thing about Luke Walton, though, I just don't know that that's different enough. JB brought Luke for a reason. Um, they think the same kind of way. Um, they have the same ideas and philosophies. And, you know, a, a big part of, of this offense, um, yes, it's JB. He's the head coach. The buck stops with him. But Luke Walton was brought here um, to coach offense and to to establish some different ideas offensively and he was a big part of this team struggling on the offensive end in the playoffs he was a big part of this team you know not rising enough throughout the course of the regular season on the offensive end so if if one of the problems that you have with jb is that his offense isn't dynamic enough it's not creative enough um, it's just not good enough for playoff level basketball. His right hand man, his quote unquote offensive coordinator, was Luke Walton. So I just don't know that that one makes all that much sense. And if if you're going to bring somebody from in house, Ethan, to me it just makes more sense to keep JB. Um, I think there's more of an argument to be made about going outside the organization and trying to introduce different things. Yeah, Chris. And I mean, I, I thought it was interesting because we have not seen Luke Walton brought up or I haven't in mm-hmm. subtext conversations or even just on the Twitterverse or Xverse, whatever it's called nowadays. <laughs> but I stopped where I did because there was a long list of subtexters that after that question or after that response responded with, I don't know if there is somebody better. And I was like, <laughs> We are all on the same page, and I just wanted to bring that back into the conversation that we've been touching on this entire podcast, because there are a couple of candidates out there that might make sense schematically or X's and O's wise, but mm-hmm. not, might not meet the bill when it comes to pay or might not meet the bill when it comes to relationship with players. Like There is a lot that goes into these conversations right. about coaching. And you mentioned it, the teams that make their decisions quite quickly after the season were already hunting (laughs) and doing their jobs beforehand to make sure that they were going to go get the right job. And also, Coach Bud, like you said, is probably the best option on the board if we're talking about ranking some top-to-bottom coaches that was on the free agent list. So, Mm -hmm. I don't know. For for me, if if I had my choice, if the Cavs move on from JB, and, and this is so difficult because um, it's hard to project what an assistant is going to be as a head coach and how that guy is going to handle the day-to-day and how that guy is going to manage personalities in that particular role, right? It's very, very different. Um, so trying to say, well, this guy was a really, really good assistant because of this, 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 and this. Well, you start adding responsibilities and you start adding the pressure that comes with being a head coach. And then you ask yourself, okay, can he handle that particular role? So because of that, for me, if the Cavs were to move on from JB, I think the best thing for them would be to explore Frank Vogel. I do. Um, I think he has had success other places. I think he's gotten a raw deal in a couple of spots. I think he's a good coach. I think he has shown himself to be a good coach. And the other one is Kenny Atkinson, because I think um, enough has been written and said about him when it comes to just his offensive principles. And I think he would bring a little bit more of the modern stuff to the Cavs. Um, He's also been very, very good in his past when it comes to player development 
And I think the value of player development is really, really important to this equation because you're trying to get the most out of Evan Mobley. If Darius Garland is back in the mix, you're trying to get the most out of him. Um, At one point, those two guys were looked at as among the four most important players in the organization. If the front office still looks at him that kind of way, you better find a coach that either has that in their background or has that in terms of what they value moving forward and see if that guy can get the most out of those two guys if they remain here. So for me personally, I think Kenny Atkinson would be the way to go because of that, or Frank Vogel. I think this I think this organization should really, really consider more of the quote-unquote retread, or the better way to phrase it to me is established and respected with more of a resume than some of these other guys that the subtexters have brought up. And that doesn't mean that some of the guys that the subtexters have brought up, um, one, are bad options, or two, um, will definitely be failures as head coaches. I don't know that. I just think for this situation specifically, um, going the route of a, a more established, more respected guy with a little bit more of a head coaching resume seems to be a better fit. Yeah, Chris, and I think I am definitely in the core of keeping JB as the coach next season. Okay. I don't think I've really thought about guys that could, like, replace him because mm-hmm. of – I I think you said it really well earlier this season, and I took note of this and kind of kept it in the back of my mind, like, of what he has been able to accomplish with this team since he got here. Like, you said it earlier in this podcast, especially knowing how down bad this team was when he got here and what he's been able to create. Like, he has gained respect in the upper management and and people that are upstairs and making those decisions to have a more fighting chance to keep his job in scenarios like this. And that's why it's a conversation and not him getting the boot as soon as the season ended. And I, I think just. You can work on relationships. You can create foundations, but you can also continue to build those. And I think we saw frustrations kind of build in situations where players wanted more on the offensive end or more schemes or more plays being drawn for them or whatever it may have been. But that's something that you can work on and grow with and understand what your players need, especially in an offseason where these guys were more than likely having their first or second season with him when they were getting multiple or more minutes than they had been used to. Yes, I'm talking mm-hmm. about Max Struess, George Niang, Tristan Thompson was back, Donovan Mitchell was in his second season. These are all guys that are continuing to grow and learn in JB's system. And it feels like he's been able to gain respect from them from the beginning of the season and maybe it just needs some refurbishing (laughs) but I I think it's I think it's interesting just to think about what this team will look like in its second year together especially with a lot of the guys that they brought for this season to be successful in the playoffs having their first run and also not having all of their star players in the mix during this past playoff season I mean, think about this. The core four, Donovan, Darius, Jarrett, and Evan Mobley, played 28 games together, Ethan, this past year. 392 total minutes. Um, 21 different lineups were used, starting lineups, in the regular season. Um, Five more were used in the postseason. The projected starting five with Max Strews, like the, the lineup that the Cavs were most excited about, especially with the addition of Max, um, that logged less than 400 total minutes. So it was clear that there were some things working against JB. Um, It was clear that there were things working against the Cavs in general, and they still finished with 48 wins. They still locked up the fourth seed. They still had home court advantage in round one, Um, and they won their first playoff series without LeBron in in more than 30 years. I just, I just don't think you can assume that someone else would have had the same kind of success. I just don't think you can assume that, you know, another coach would have gotten them to, to stay believing, stay connected, 
um, deal with adversity the same kind of way. And that doesn't mean that JB did everything right or does everything right. Um, but it's like when, when you have a team that has gotten better and gone further every season under a coach and you have a coach who has shown um, an ability to improve from one year to the next, um, it's really, really hard to sit here and say, well, you know what, man, that's not good enough. Like, I know that this team has gotten better and you have gotten better. I know that this team went further this year than it did last year, but that's just not enough. We're going to go a different direction. Now, teams have done that in the past, and teams will continue to do that moving forward. I just don't know if if the Cavs are, are ready to make that kind of decision yet at this point. And here's something else to consider. The, the last time that the Cavs went through this whole coaching search thing, it was an extensive search. They interviewed a ton of people. It led them to John Beeline, which again, was a complete and utter disaster. You know who finished second? J.B. Bickerstaff. So there was something that the Cavs liked about J.B. This was way back. Before hiring John Beeline, there was something that they liked about JB enough to make him a finalist for the job amongst that extensive pool of candidates and be the guy that they tabbed um, to one, be John Beeline's right hand man, and two, be the guy who was going to take over eventually. Now, eventually came a lot sooner <laughs> than anybody expected in the Beeline era, but they liked something about JB to begin with. And since he became coach, like that in a way was validated because of the success that they've had with him. And I just think it's hard to assume that they would find somebody better than JB. All right, Chris, I'm going to end the podcast with this. This is my end all take. Like also knowing that JB Bickerstaff, like you said, the team dealt with adversity. He dealt with adversity. He was on the hot seat a lot this season. Oh, yeah. And to deal with that and to be even keeled and to have his players back in every scenario and to know that he dealt with all of that. When Darius Garland and Evan Mobley went down, he was mm-hmm. on the hot seat. During the playoffs, he was on the hot seat. Even towards the end of the season, he was on the hot seat. Like, there is a different level of being able to deal with pressure, especially when you, like, from the outside looking in, sometimes you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. The Athletic mm-hmm. reported that there was an argument between Kobe Altman and J.B. Bickerstaff or a frustration outburst by Kobe Altman at J.B. Bickerstaff that made the team kind of question what J.B. was doing. Mm-hmm. and. To deal with that, that happened like in December, if I believe correctly. Mm -hmm. And to deal with that from December until now, and to still be like, I'm holding my head above water, and they haven't told me I'm not the coach yet, so I'm going to (laughs) keep coming back and coming to work. Like, that's a confidence, that's a instillment of just life that you need as a head coach. Because if you're not even keeled on every day of the job, you're not cut out for it. And we saw the Devin, Devin, Denver Nuggets coach kind of burst out after the, the, the uh, loss last night talking about F being up 20 <laughs> when, when a reporter <laughs> asked him. So, like, it, sometimes everybody gets frustrated. And sometimes frustration gets the bust at everybody. But there was not one time this season where I saw Jay Rick and staff, like, snap because of everything he was dealing with behind the scenes. And I think that's a testament to his character and his resolve Mm. and why he could and should be, in my eyes, continue to be the head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers next season. But I think that's how I'm going to end up this podcast. But with all that being said, that'll wrap up today's episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. But remember to become a Cavs insider and interact with Chris and me by subscribing to Subtext. This is where you can get all the insight when it comes to new news this offseason. And to get that, 
all you have to do is sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word STOP. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from me and Chris. This isn't just our podcast, it's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. Y'all be safe. We out.